Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Marshall Beyer, Senior Director here at CSI, a Moody's analytics company. I am pleased to welcome you to this webinar, Comprehensive Financial Planning, How Client Relationships Are Changing. Uh, before we begin the webinar, I just have a few housekeeping notes. The ratings, financial analysis, projections, and other observations constituting part of the information contained herein are and must be construed solely as statements of opinion and not statements of fact or recommendations to purchase, sell, or hold any securities. Uh, we strongly recommend you speak with a qualified financial advisor regarding your own unique circumstances. Uh, we ask that no one record this webinar without Moody's explicit written permission. Lastly, no one has permission to quote any of the comments made or questions asked by the webinar audience. Uh, for your information, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, all members of the audience are currently on mute. If you have a question, and we encourage you to uh, ask questions that you do have, please type the question in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. And we ask that you please keep your questions as generic as possible and avoid personal or client-specific information. Now on to the webinar. The focus of today's broadcast is how customer relationships in the wealth management industry are changing and are expected to change in the future. We are extremely fortunate to have three great speakers, each taking a different perspective. Looking at the macro environment is Goshka Folda, who will lead off this webinar. Goshka is president and CEO of Investor Economics, which is the leading provider of thought leadership, fact-based measurement, and analysis of Canada's retail financial services. Investor Economics is part of the ISS Market Intelligent family, which provides critical data, insight, and workflow solutions to global asset managers, insurance companies, and distributors. Goshka is the head of global research with ISS. We're also fortunate to have Carissa Lucreziano, uh, who will follow Goshka, and she will give a perspective of customer relationships from the financial from the perspective of the financial institution. She is Vice President, Financial and Investment Advice at CIBC. She is a seasoned financial advice expert with over two decades of industry experience and is passionate about educating and empower, empowering Canadians to achieve their financial goals. Her expertise includes leading and developing strategy for national advisory networks and national teams of wealth, advisory, tax, and estate planners for the ultra high net worth and the family office space as well as managing large-scale relationships for investment distribution with asset management. We have also Sean Shore, who will provide a perspective of evolving customer relationships through a regulatory lens with a spotlight on customer-focused reforms or client-focused reforms. Sean is a securities compliance and regulatory lawyer with the Canadian Compliance and Regulatory Law Group. He has been part of the financial services industry as a chief compliance officer, regulatory professional, lawyer, and most importantly, trusted business partner. He helps his partners succeed by marrying his skills in risk mitigation with legal advice and operational scalability and works to promote the understanding of the Canadian regulatory landscape to produce rational risk-weighted results that demonstrate compliance. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Goshka. Thank you very much, Marshall. And uh, thank you to Moody's Analytics and the uh, CSI for putting me uh, in front of the audience that I love, which is the audience of advisors. You guys are on the front lines of the wealth management business and uh, helping Canadians uh, accomplishing their financial success. So uh, thank you very much once again to Moody's Analytics and to uh, Canadian Securities Institute for including me in this great webinar. So um, for those of you who have heard me speak before, uh, you know that I like to think about the business in a kind of in a big picture way. And hopefully today I'll walk you through some, uh, some of the big ideas that we're thinking of at Investor Economics and globally at ISIS Market Intelligence and tell you a little bit about what we think is going to be the future of advice giving and how you can uh, set yourself up for, for growth and success in the future. So stepping back in my usual fashion, let's start at the very top. And I think that we live in a very interesting time in this business since we started Invest Economics 1992. This is probably 
as exciting as when we started the business. This is a, a really sea change in many different ways. And here I'm just showing you the four macro forces. So it's not just the change within the business. So it's not just you competing against other advisors, against other distributors, against other institutions, other asset managers, but it is really um, a lot of the fate of the wealth management business and advice giving also is impacted by what I would call these four external forces. And there are forces beyond anyone's control. Um, one is demographics. We'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. But of course, right now, we're seeing the transition of the great baby boomer generation into the retirement, silent generation already being there, and then kind of the arrival of Gen X to the last final years before retirement in terms of saving, and then the arrival of the younger generation like the millennials or echo boomers and Gen Z. So a big, big, vast tectonic shift of demographic place. So you have to think about it because when you think about your kind of, if your book of business in many ways resembles the Canadian universe of, of uh, households, then probably your clients are changing, their needs are changing, whether whether you whether they they want it or not because they are simply progressing along their financial journey throughout their they, their household life cycle so that's an important thought the other one is technology we'll talk a little bit about it but of course there's a lot of disruption we all have lived through the pandemic you guys have lived through the pandemic and i know you're in front of clients day in day out and suddenly poof we cannot see anyone so everybody understands that that kind of acceleration that happened through the pandemic of course, now we're also doing a lot of in face-to-face uh, -face meetings, but of course, technology is changing. Robo advisors will talk a little bit about that and other technological um, uh, ideas that, that are out there that are shaping the expectations of your clients. Uh, regulation, and uh, we're um, uh, lucky to have uh, Sean um, uh, kind of uh, speak about that later, the impact of the client focus uh, reforms. But, you know, clearly this has been a very busy regulatory agenda for the past decade or so, and I don't see any kind of um, uh, uh, any any light uh, at the end of this particular tale, tale, uh, tunnel in terms of continuing uh, change. So I think it's an important thought, but you know what? Um, we articulated uh, articulated the impact of those big forces probably six, seven, eight years ago in our household balance sheet report work. But, uh, you know, in an environment when uh, the, uh, the macroeconomic bank backdrop was strong and so was the market environment, a lot of this change that is really driven by these external forces was almost taking a backseat to just participating in the longest, run bull, longest running bull market. So uh, I think that right now, in the absence of that supportive environment of macroeconomics backdrop and also of the market environment, I think suddenly a lot of these changes, a lot of these forces are amplifying and the industry responses are changing. When we move to the next slide, this shows a very quick snapshot of, and you're only maybe the, the fifth audience that I'm presenting this to, this is um, our very, uh, very latest forecast for growth of the overall household wallet in Canada. Right now, it's about $6.2 trillion. Remember, inside that wallet, we have everything from deposits, checking savings, mutual funds, seg funds, individual holdings of ETFs, uh, individual holdings of securities and fee-based accounts and commission-based accounts, and so and discretionary money at the high end of the spectrum. Also included defined contribution, pension plans, and group RSPs. So that's a very big pool of money and I would say this is kind of the addressable market for yourselves, uh, investable market. And what you can see on the left-hand side, the two buttons of the, 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 the growth pattern over the next decade, you can see that we're going to shed about 1.2% of the annual average growth rate and the market is going to grow at 6.2%. The good news is that the market is still going, uh, investable asset pool is going to go almost double from the current 6.2 trillion to, to, uh, to over $11 trillion. So still a lot of opportunity, but the, the, that pattern of growth at 6.2% suggests that there is going to be a lot more takeaway game, as we like to say at Investor Economics, competition for incoming dollars. And you have to ensure that your value proposition, your offer resonates strongly because a lot of uh, 
companies, a lot of other advisors, a lot of other distributors are going to be competing for the same dollars. And also, it is important to understand that households are going through what I would say the big financial squeeze right now. And on the right hand side at the top, you can see just the, the change of pattern in the overall investable assets for Canadian households. We trailed it all the way back to the big financial crisis and, and the, 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 the fiasco of 2008 and 9. And you can see that at that time, household wealth, largely on paper, we had more than recovered that, uh, went down by about $300 billion. If you recall, everybody thought the world was going to, to uh, uh, you know, into falling into pieces. Now, when you actually look at 2022, you can you can see that again, households shed about $300 billion. If we were to stop the clock at midpoint of 2022, actually the paper loss was about half a trillion dollars on the six to trillion dollars, not an insignificant, almost a 10% down draft. So I think that that's something important to keep in mind because that means that you're going to not only uh, be facing households that are squeezed by the macroeconomic conditions, by interest rates, uh, by their uh, overhang of uh, large debt, which of course interest rates are not helping with, and inflation at the other end, they'll be fearful because they have now again, 13 years later, experienced some very significant attrition in their wealth. If we move to the next slide, we, um, we try to identify for you three opportunities that given all these, the impact of the external forces and where we think the wealth is going, these are opportunities that you can um, uh, attack in the coming decade. Uh, but also I will insert a note of caution there. There is all, these are also um, uh, potential retention challenges for you, because uh, unless you have a strong play in these uh, cohorts, it may well be that others are going to, you know, retaining those clients are going to be very difficult. And that's aging baby boomers, the high net worth investor and women. On the next slide, we dig a little bit um, deeper into the kind of the nature of the demographic picture. You heard me speak a lot about um, already about the baby boomer generation and the kind of the tectonic plates of demographics shifting that will that is really I think uh, well exemplified by this uh, table on the left hand side and let me just walk you through it at the top we show the change in thousands in terms of the number of households in each of the major cohorts, um, demographic cohorts. So if your book of business kind of resembles slightly, maybe a bit older, uh, skewing to the baby boomers Gen X and silent generation, but largely these are the opportunities. So you can see that actually the baby boomer generation is going to start actually shedding households. And there is going to be about half a million households that are going to disappear from that cohort by virtue of the expiration of those households. That raises the idea, do you have a resonating um, offer for retiree households? Do you have a, a good offer on the state planning? Do you have a multi-generational um, offer? Because of course the expiration of those households will trigger um, uh, an inheritance phase, roughly 1.2 trillion uh, dollars of of assets, investable assets, and real estate assets is going to be moving uh, uh, um, between generations. So I think that that's those are important thoughts for you to understand that that generation still will have a commanding control of the wallet. Almost uh, forty nine percent of the entire investable assets is going to ten years from now, twenty thirty two, is going to be with those baby boomer households and the very, very few remaining silent generation households. So that's important. So understanding how to assist that aging demographics is going to be very, very important. Of course, at the other end of uh, the spectrum, there are also the younger households that are coming in. I would say that's a that's a secondary, but an important opportunity for you to keep in mind as part of your strategies um, uh, um, uh, for kind of engaging the next uh, layer of um, uh, of um, uh, of your clientele and building multi generational um, client engagement strategies. On the right hand side, you can see the absolute enormous amount of households in the Gen X, uh, in the Gen Z, and the millennial cohorts that joined the cadre of investors largely through the online brokerage 
or robo advice you can see the number of accounts you can see the number um, a, a kind of a stunning number of, of um, accounts that were opened um, uh, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. So these many of these clients, uh, investors, have arrived into investing into the investing world, but many of them have had very very rough go at it. Uh, we are seeing this from a lot of numbers that we're tracking for both online discount brokerage as well as for robo advice. So I think there's an opportunity to engage those households that are newer to investing. But of course, you have to ensure that your offer is uh, going to kind of uh, recognize the different needs that those households have. When we uh, and and I'm sure Carissa is going to speak about that as well, and she's uh, you know an expert in 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 holistic planning. But the importance of that estate planning, of that retirement income planning, uh, and also of developing strategies of engaging the next generation of investors, very very important for you. The next slide uh, uh, drills a little bit uh, uh, deeper into the um, idea of um, a high net worth uh, investors. So when you think about high net worth, we call them actually affluent investors. They are about a million dollars plus of investable assets. And one really, uh, you know, two fascinating things about that. Number one, is that um, that cohort of 1 million plus, remember, investable assets, that does not include real estate assets, and that's, an, I think, an important uh, consideration for, uh, for you. Um, and I think that that's, uh, uh, when you think about it, 9% of households are going to own 80% of wealth in Canada. So that's, a, I would say, a dramatic uh, type of uh, number. Of course, everybody's chasing up their high net worth, and there is the high net worth of the yesteryear, which are the you know many generations of families that have kind of uh, amassed wealth over decades in Canada. But that cohort of high net worth investors is also changing. Um, there are many more um, entrepreneurs selling their businesses. There are younger uh, uh, millionaires. Um, there are immigrant uh, millionaire families. They are graduating millionaires from the mass affluent market. So it's very important to recognize that actually there'll be a great diversity to that high net worth opportunity. And I think you'll have a very, very strong opportunity to engage a kind of a, a new uh, new uh, hue of um, uh, affluent investors uh, and work with them in your practice and really surround them with a lot of important aspects of financial, their financial lives, provision of those services. When we move to the next slide, we, we uh, uh, kind of uh, close the opportunity set with a look at um, female investors. You can see that right now, uh, almost half of the, more than half of the population are females. Uh, um, the control of household wealth going to move very close to 50% by 2030. So that's, I think, a huge opportunity. Um, I won't belabor the point, but developing relationships with both partners within within the, the family unit and, and with the next generation of female partners as well is very, very important. And, and uh, that kind of uh, desire for more planning and consultative approach is very important when um, uh, catering to female investors. The next uh, slide is kind of brings it all together. Um, and I'm sure uh, Chris is going to talk a lot uh, more eloquently about that. But I go back to the slide on the left hand side, which really talks about the fact that the, the resonant um, uh, value proposition by advisors um, is going of the of the future is going to recognize that diversity in the in the in the type of investors that are coming to the table, the demographic diversity, um, ensuring that your value proposition is holistic, that it takes uh, that is able to to really support um, your uh, clients in a variety of financial issues and topics from all the way from uh, 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 of debt management for the younger households all the way to retirement income and tax efficiency and uh, deriving income and estate planning at the older uh, uh, range of your clients. And helping you with that is going to be also um, um, uh, just an, a, a huge amplification of interactive 
um, uh, um, uh, uh, toolkits uh, in terms of financial planning. So this is where technology, I think, will continue to assist you. And I know that a lot of your uh, distributors, dealers are deploying new technologies by the day and amplifying the repertoire of tools that you can leverage and, and work to, to the benefit of your clients. So with that, I'm going to I have run out of time. I've, I've gone one minute over, so I will now pause and pass the baton back to Marshall. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Goshka. That was a great uh, overview of the uh, of the macro environment and identification of sort of three main main um, main I mean markets for advisors to be to be looking at. And uh, I know we have some questions, but maybe we'll leave the questions to the end. So I'm going to turn it over to Carissa now, who's going to talk about uh, wealth management and, and changing uh, customer relationships from the uh, financial institution perspective. Carissa? Hi there. Can you hear me and see me? Um, we could hear you. There's a bit of an echo. Um, Wait, you're on mute now, Chris. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. And you can see me, I hope. So we can. Apologies yes. for apologies for the little bit of technology uh, challenges, but you know what? Um, we're we're here, and I just want to thank the CSI and all of the panelists with me for uh, for hosting today. What a great topic! And, you know, such a great opportunity to speak to the professionals in the financial uh, planning and financial advice spectrum. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, financial well-being as a whole. And, you know, uh, what was just said, I could not agree more. This is a huge transformation in financial well-being. Financial education is so important for our clients, as well as the relationships that we build. But there's a few things, and, and many of us has real, uh, have realized this. Uh, also, many of us have put it into our practices in different ways and forms, especially over the last few years. I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, some some more technology advances in uh, in relationship building when it comes to financial planning. So, you know, digital tools and platforms they've enabled clients to do a lot more. Um, when we look about what Canadians and what clients are looking for, and a lot of the work that I do is they are looking for advice. Advice uh, from a professional is still very, very important. But Canadians are also looking for those digital tools to complement, to be able to kind of, you know, look at their budget, uh, you know, on a, on a personal basis, to maybe, you know, use a calculator. Um, you know, specifically calculators, financial calculators are one of the most uh, important tools for clients and Canadians these days. And so, uh, you know, with advances in technology, changing clients' expectation, all this is playing a significant role in, you know, advice evolution. And it's now the norm for financial institutions and others to provide these digital financial education, tool, education tools. Um, you know, you think about right now and, and many of our clients, and, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what spectrum you're really on when it comes to net worth. Everybody is being affected by the macroeconomic environment and everything that, you know, we're, we're dealing with. So, a budgeting and looking, uh, you know, at that cash flow management is something that all Canadians are looking at. How they're looking at it and in what form and, and how they're able to, you know, move forward is a little bit of a different conversation with everyone, but that's something that is really, really important and impactful to Canadians today is making their dollar stretch further because we know it's, it's been a little bit tough uh, for the last few years, to say the least. Um, in CIBC proprietary research, we found that, you know, more than 50% of Canadians and clients, they want to engage in digital tools. And it, it increases overall satisfaction with that relationship manager. Um, we've focused over the last two years on building a really great library of tools that has been really well sought after. I know uh, others, the Bank of Canada, uh, FCAC, have also done some work around their budgeting tools and others and have, have had some really significant uplift in usage. Um, when it comes to overall financial well-being and advice, we're also seeing um, a lot of, of more financial education being out there. And, you know, the expectations of financial education are on the rise. There's new platforms like FinTalk and podcasts as a source of consumable information. Now, 49% of Canadians say that they wish they knew more about tools and resources to get help and grasp their finances. And there's a really healthy balance there, I think, you know. Um, it's great for our clients and Canadians in general to search for tools and do some of their research, but at the end of the day, 
we want them coming to the profession. We want them having that fulsome experience of advice and what and what you all um, what you all deliver. Um, we have an enormous opportunity within our profession to meet clients where they are and provide and provide them with the advice that they're seeking. So these digital tools, um, resources, pieces that I've talked about are really complementary to the overall offer. Um, for an example, we uh, we launched a podcast uh, early on this May at CIBC, and it's called Smart Advice, I'm the Host, we looked at uh, the opportunity in Canada to speak to Canadians about things that matter, financial wellness, financial education, advice, economics, market. And I'll tell you, uh, overwhelmingly, there's been a huge appetite to consume this information, over 60,000 listeners, and some great feedback. So looking at, you know, what Canadians are actually thinking about and what they're what they want to consume, it is really a good blend of great solid advice from our professionals, but tools and resources and digital um, and digital components also help. Let's talk a little bit about the growth in mobile banking apps. So there is um, a huge growth in mobile banking apps. And again, for those more simplistic pieces and things that clients want to do very, very quickly. Um, it is mobile first, the future of digital finance. Um, and day-to-day -day banking, as I mentioned, is, is, is primarily mobile. So things that you could open up a bank account or maybe apply for a visa, those are things that the appetite from our clients would want to be able to fulfill online. And, you know, almost 50% of Canadians are using mobile banking regularly. It is the, it is a major conduit. And so, uh, you know, at CIBC, our mobile banking app has been given one of the highest overall scores. Um, you know, there are across the board when it comes to mobile apps and in terms of financial institutions, more of our clients are going there to get their information, um, to really look at their statements at, um, at anything and everything there is to do with organizing their, fi their finances. So it really is important um, that, you know, uh, financial institutions continue to invest in this and provide those resources to uh, the advisors to be able to share with clients. But lastly, uh, on remote client onboarding, this is something that is becoming really, really uh, more prevalent. Um, Canadian clients want to be able to find uh, an advisor. They want to be able to find a professional online, connect with a professional online. So there are investments across the board, and this is across all financial institutions, to be able to connect more broadly with, um, with, it, with an advisor, but also have a good understanding of where that client needs to be. So if it's a business banking client, you know, connecting them with somebody in business banking, an advisory specialist, if it's somebody in the private wealth spectrum, connecting them with a private banker, and so on. So, you know, connecting online is one thing, but also getting clients and Canadians to where they want to be digitally through a really seamless journey is something that, you know, Canadians really want to be uh, sought after. Just to give you a little bit of research, uh, I do a lot of it in partnership with our team at CIBC. Um, global traffic, uh, in 2022 was seven times larger than in 2017, so taking a, a few years. You know, 61% of Google searches took place on a mobile device in 2021, and 71% of millennials, and we just were kind of talking about that, believe that they should be able to do any banking task on mobile. So we know, uh, again, if I just close off on this point, uh, the future of advice is bright. The future of professional advice and, and, and the way in which that this profession can uh, help clients grow their wealth over time is extremely sought after. The complement to your business practice and the opportunity to leverage digital tools as that complement to help clients is, uh, is, is a really big one. So um, on to the next uh, slide. So we'll talk a little bit and I'll end on uh, financial planning and, and planning for all Canadians and financial well-being as a whole. So during the pandemic, um, obviously we couldn't meet in person, and there was almost like a uh, a rush to find financial information and, and get financial um, advice online. So as you've seen, and uh, myself as well, uh, there's been a, a, an influx of um, client virtual and social media education, and that, in my opinion, is just starting. Um, client events are extremely popular to clients. Now again. Uh, depending on the topic and depending on targeting is also really important. So uh, when it comes to virtual events that I've done, some of the most popular ones are, of course, uh, economic outlook uh, for, for the year and even kind of mid-year, what should Canadians be thinking about in the economic environment? We had over 30,000 clients um, uh, register 
for uh, an economic overview with one of our economists. So it shows you the appetite. Uh, some other big topics, as you're very well aware, is retirement. So retirement is a big one, but more on the wealth transition and intergenerational uh, wealth platform. So understanding what are some of the conversations we need to be having, this intergenerational wealth, uh, how do we start to do that while we're while we're still here and plan and, and include the family? That was a very heavy topic. And then planning, investment planning in retirement. Huge, huge topic. Over 18,000 clients attended one of our webinars for that. So you'll see across the board uh, all the different financial institutions and those uh, alike are, are reaching out to Canadians and clients more in that form. And I think it's very important, like we're doing today, very important to have these conversations. The reach is so much more. So another opportunity for you to leverage, and I'm sure you are, with your own institution, is, is where can you leverage these uh, client events? And some may be in person, some may be virtual, but where can you leverage to get that reach to provide your clients with that you know, additional financial well-being uh, information and education that they really want? Senior support, very important. And I think I would say that um, you know, across the board, I think financial institutions in general are really wrapping their arms around seniors in terms of all different uh, aspects. Of course, um, technology and you know, making sure that you know, security measures are in place. That's one of the things that you know, are very important. Uh, the FCAC and others have a very strong focus on seniors and you know, helping them protect their wealth, but also helping support them in the advice journey. Um, that goes from making day-to-day -day banking um, more accessible and, and user-friendly tools and connecting uh, our seniors' clients with you know, uh, individuals that can help them. So that's another big, big piece and where you'll see an emerging trend of really the focus in speaking to Canadians on advice and planning. Uh, support for newcomers to Canada and multilingual support kind of go hand in hand. And there is a huge opportunity to engage and welcome newcomers to Canada as well as speak to the newcomers in the language that they're comfortable in and, and welcome them into the community within our own community. So uh, you'll see, in, and within your own institutions that you work with, there's probably hubs and, and things that you, know, you could link directly to for specific communities. Those are really important to leverage and connecting within those, uh, those resources within your firm to connect with those newcomers and help them to make them feel welcome. So, you know, all in all, uh, when you think about financial well-being in general, um, advice and planning, I, I keep on saying this year over year, it's never been more <laughs> sought after, but the industry, our profession in financial planning um, is, so, it, it, it's so important. And um, Canadians, whether they are ready for it or not, or whether they, you know, uh, have the confidence to uh, seek out advice, they want advice. They want advice. They want it in, you know, the way that it suits them, and they need someone to help them along the way. So thinking about your practice and your relationships and your business, you know, you also want to think about the digital resources and tools that you have to complement, as well as, you know, um, complementing, you know, your advice with pieces and resources and education that your clients uh, may seem very valuable. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Marshall. Thank you so much uh, for having me on today. Okay, thank you very much, Carissa. That was great. And thanks for over overcoming the, uh, the technological challenges. Um, but that, that was a great presentation. And now we are going to turn it over to Sean Shore, who's going to give us a regulatory compliance perspective. Sean, over to you. Thank you very much, Marshall, and uh, thank you, uh, Carissa and Goshka, for the great information and presentation. I'm going to leverage off of that to a subject that I think we're all familiar with, and that's compliance, which is one of my favorite subjects, obviously. But in particular, uh, it's the release of some rules uh, from a couple of years ago that are now fully enforced, known as the client-focused reforms of a package of rule amendments known as the client-focused reforms. And it was interesting, I was listening to what Carissa said at the end about Really, the end game here is to provide advice and to service our clients. And, and that's precisely what we all want. And these rules are meant to 
to perpetuate that. They're meant to ensure that. And one of the things that that I'm often talking to registrants about is their ability to ensure that they protect themselves. And in particular, one of their most one of their most important assets, which is their license. And my observation from the release of, of the client focus reforms, you know, f- focuses on the requirements that are, are now in force uh, and, and in particular, the importance of documentation. And all of this goes to say to my original point, which is these are all good for us. Uh, we may not like them, um, kind of like going to the doctor or the dentist, but they're good for us. And ultimately, they allow us to get down to business and focus on what we all, all want to do, which is service and help our clients. Okay, so with that with that background, I'm just going to go over some, some information here, background information on the client focus reform. So originally, phase one of these was released pre-COVID and um, in, in late, uh, early October of 2019. And really, the idea here, and, and this shouldn't come as a surprise to us, uh, that, uh, that these are going to promote the idea that the client's interests have to come first. And, and I know, I think we all can agree that that goes without saying, but it's stated very, very clearly in the uh, background information to uh, the client focus reforms, you know, that these amendments are going to, you know, specifically deal with material conflicts of interest and making sure they're resolved in the best interest of the client if they can be resolved, putting clients' interest first when dealing with suitability assessments, and providing clar- clarity uh, to clients in terms of what they should expect out of their advisors, as well as what their relationship is with their advisors and their dealers or their uh, firm registrants. And, and really, we're talking about alignment. We're talking about aligning the interests of registrants and their clients and improving outcomes for clients. That was phase one. Phase two was a little more targeted. And again, in my opinion, uh, critically important given our aging demographic, which is to promote the protection, enhance the protection for vulnerable clients. Now, vulnerability is not just necessarily linked to age, but it often is. It could be vulnerability due to mental illness, due to undue uh, undue influence, uh, oppression from family members, financial exploitation, and so on and so forth. So, But these amendments, uh, which I think a lot of the industry had been informally doing uh, along the way for many years, these are now enshrined in law. And I'll just pause there for a second. When I keep speaking about these amendments and client focused reforms, these were implemented at the Canadian Securities Administrator level, which means, and they were imposed uh, down to both previously IROC and the MFTA, as well as the exec market and others. So when we talk about and now, IROC and the MFTA are now merged as zero, in case you, you weren't aware. But when we talk about this, this was also an opportunity to harmonize the rules and make sure that there was no, for lack of a better word, regulatory arbitrage opportunities in terms of one rule said this and the other rule at the MFDA or uh, portfolio management level may have not been quite worded as as identically or identically at all. So the the one the one really really important thing to take away from client focused reforms among among many is that we we now have a very very harmonized approach to regulation that is applicable wherever the client shows up. Show up to an exempt market dealer. Same thing. Show up to a portfolio manager registered, regulated by the CSA. Same thing. Show up to a zero dealer. Same thing. So that's really the gist, the overview of client focused reforms. Now, if we go to the next slide, we're going to get into the the nuts and bolts of what has changed. And and I'm really hoping, and I sort of say this a bit in jest, that when we're talking about things like know your client or suitability or conflicts or know your product, that nobody's scratching their head saying, I've never heard of this before. Because if that's the case, that's a, that's a real problem. So again, I'm saying that in jest. We've all heard these things before. And, and the air that we're breathing now, the client-focused reform air that we're breathing now is going to be very similar, if not identical, to the air that we were breathing five years ago, or at least it should be. Because the concept of know your client has been around forever and suitability and know your product, whether it's as a rule or an industry expectation or a best practice, they've been around. That's my position, at least. So in terms of know your client, we've seen a very clear articulation of what is expected registrants, what is expected of registrants and what they do when they're capturing information at the time of onboarding. And not just at the beginning of a relationship, but throughout our relationship with our clients. That's another really, really important thing that I stress to the firms that I work with, which is the time for gathering client information is now. And it's always. 
So anytime you have an opportunity to be in front of the client, which is which is a privilege for all of us, we should always be asking the question, has anything changed? Is there anything you need to tell me? And that's really important because it emphasizes that it's an ongoing obligation. And it also emphasizes that the client plays a critically important role in this relationship. You know how we always hear relationships are two-way streets. This is no different. As much as we have obligations to our clients to collect information, they have obligations to us to regularly update us. And that's very, very important. So in terms of what we're seeing there on the left of the slide, personal circumstances, financial circumstances, investment knowledge, risk risk and investment time horizon. These are all very common and we should be familiar with these. There was a slight change to wording in terms of risk where they specifically speak to risk profile, which is a function of tolerance plus capacity. So my ability to sleep at night, withstand the pressure of, of taking risk, and then my capacity to endure loss, which is capacity. So that was a very, very notable change. But my approach to this is very simple. I need to collect as much information as I can so that I can make a suitable investment recommendation. That's that's the point here. These categories are very, very broad and should do the trick for you, but I'm a very open book when it comes to dealing with end clients, which is tell me everything you can. That will help me give you more information so that you can make a better decision. And I talk about this in the concept of when you go to your doctor, they want you to be able to give them informed consent when they're about to do a procedure on you, for example. So they don't hold back. They tell you about all the risks, all the benefits, and we're no different. We wanna gather up as much information as possible about our clients, and we wanna keep it current on an ongoing basis so that we can make always be in a position to make suitable trade recommendations. We're gonna get into that in a second, because I'm not just talking about a trade recommendation, I'm talking about an investment action, which is also something that was a, a slight uh, shift, but probably goes without saying. So the other items in, in under the KYC bucket, we want to be confirming KYC information with the client, which is obvious. We want to be making sure we're always updating that information, but in particular, if there's a significant change to that information. So the best practice, again, and I'm going to sound like a broken record here because I focus on documentation. I also do work with clients at times when they're in, they're in, in a problematic position where they have a client complaint, a regulatory investigation, or a civil lawsuit. So these are the things that I see that aren't being done. And a lot of this is going to be solved by having a robust process, having something that's a repeatable process, a scalable process, and most importantly, documenting everything that you hear from the client and everything that you say to the client. And it sounds overwhelming, but once you get into the habit of it, things go much smoother. And the last thing that I'll point out is that we now have form intervals where we are required to ha have conversations, reach out to clients, and decide if um, the account in question uh, needs updating. Uh, 12 months for discretionary accounts, 36 months for all others. And again, I'm glossing over some things. I would I would highly encourage you to read the rules that are applicable to you, whether it's under the mutual fund dealer rules under CERO, the investment dealer rules under uh, under CERO, uh, and, and to make sure that you have a full familiarity with uh, what's required of you. And of course, rely and leverage on your compliance department. So in terms of suitability, uh, this is a core requirement. And, and clearly, we must put the client's interest first. Suitability is through the client's eyes. Is this suitable for them? Not is it suitable for the advisor? And, and it applies to any investment action. So I was mentioning trade recommendations before, but now we're talking about investment actions, a buy, a sell, a hold. And it also applies to doing nothing. So we have an obligation under the rules to make sure that the positions in the account or actions are suitable when the fault, when certain items, when certain actions occur. So if I'm going to make a trade recommendation, a sell recommendation, if I decide to stay in cash, is that suitable and why? And the factors that we're going to look at or that a registrant needs to look at to evaluate whether or not the action is suitable, um, is it suitable based on the the you know your client information you have, the product information that you've gathered, the impact of the action on the account in terms of liquidity and concentration, the costs of the action. And this is the one that ca has caused, I think, a lot of grief among registrants. Is, is, is it a, it, are, what, what is your comparison told you about the reasonable range of alternative actions? What comparables have you looked at? If I'm recommending that someone buy a particular mutual fund, have I compared that to other mutual funds in its peer group? And why am I picking that one? And am I picking that one because it's proprietary? Am I picking that one because I get paid more? Or am I picking it because it's the one that I feel, in my professional opinion, is most suitable? 
So those cate- those items plus the action must put the client's interest first. So we've got two categories, uh, KYC, KYP, impact on account, costs, and reasonable range of alternative actions, plus putting the client's interest first. That has to happen every single time. And on top of that, you have to document it every single time. And again, I'm, I'm, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's so important that we protect ourselves to, so that we can support the, the advice that we've given to clients. And part of that is maintaining a very robust document documentary record. Typically, in my opinion and in my travels, that happens um, that happens contemporaneously with the event in question, with the, the conversation that I'm having with the client in question. There are a number of trigger events that are going to cause us to do suitability reviews on accounts. And, and then another issue that is incredibly, incredibly important, which I get asked all the time about, is uh, client-directed traits. And so uh, gone are the days, again, in my opinion, I don't think they ever existed. When the, your phone rings, the client says, I want to buy shares of Tesla, let's say, for example, and you just mark it unsolicited and away you go. Now there is a very, very regimented process for us to follow to, to consider whether or not that action is suitable, regardless of whether we're recommending it or not, and how we document that going forward. So my advice to the audience today is be incredibly, incredibly diligent when you think you're getting a client-directed trade. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to get into Know Your Product, which is arguably one of my favorite areas to talk about. Um, in, in, in the dealer world, uh, this really represents a codification of industry practices. If I said to an advisor on the line, have you, have, have you heard of this idea that you need to understand what you're selling before you sell it to the client? It would be the equivalent of a, a car salesperson not really understanding that a car has a steering wheel, four tires, sometimes you fill it with fuel, sometimes you plug it in, but I don't really know really how it works other than that. If, if we were to talk about this in, in, in reality, of course we want to know our product because without know your product or without us knowing our client, we can't make a suitable trade recommendation or we can't perform a suitability assessment on our investment action if we don't understand what we're selling. So now we have very, very clear obligations, prescriptive obligations on both firms as well as registrants, so that both the firm and the registrant need to understand what they're selling. Firms need to make sure that they assess, approve, and monitor securities on their shelf before they're made available. These are ongoing requirements, so if things change, um, they, they have to make sure that the change still warrants that the item in question is still on their shelf. And inter- in individuals must understand the structure, features, risks, and costs of a particular product. Now, this ranges. We have a range of products in the known universe going from simple securities like shares of a publicly traded company to a structured product or a complex product or something that really on its face is not as simple as it seems. So dealer, so pardon me, registrants, I come for the I come from the the dealer world. So you'll have to forgive me if I'm constantly saying dealer. What I mean is registrant. In the registrant world at the firm level, we need to make sure we have a policy that's documented, a process for approvals, and we also have a committee. And the committee is going to be a product review type committee that assesses requests from advisors who want to sell a particular product or want to have it made available to them to sell to their clients. This is what has to happen now. There's a training function. So if a particular product is very complex and the product review committee considers one of the aspects um, in order for it to be sold properly, that training must happen, then the firm has to have training available. And again, the point there at the end, number six, is we want to distinguish between simple products and complex products. That's very, very important. The last item on this slide is Conflicts of interest. Again, this is a codification of industry practices. Conflicts have existed forever and how we deal with them. It's very straightforward. We have to identify them. We have to address them, avoid them, control them. And these have to be, if we're going to allow the contract conflict to exist, they have to be uh, adjudicated in the best interests of our clients. And part of that is providing disclosure, but it's not the end. It's not, it's not the be all end all. Disclosure enough is not going to be sufficient for us to discharge our obligations here. So again, no surprise, we're going to have a policy process documentation work product of how a firm and an advisor have um, have identified their products on a regular basis and disclose those to clients. Part of that's going to be in tr- uh, part of that's going to involve training and pro- uh, firms providing training to their um, their uh, 
individual registrants. And what we've seen in the market already is that the regulators, uh, and, and I think this is a good thing, the CSA and, and CIRO have gone out to firms to test this. So the, the, the client focus reforms have been in, in, uh, in full bloom for a couple of years. And now we're seeing uh, sweeps that are coming out by the regulators to test how well the industry is adopting or coping to these new requirements. So let's just have a look at the next slide. So now another wonderful area that uh, seems to be uh, a never ending uh, uh, tribulation for me in my practice is marketing and advertising. So uh, I start off very simply, marketing and advertising is, is registrable activity. Trade, trade in, in quotes, trade is, uh, is, uh, includes under, in securities legislation, trade includes marketing and advertising. So when we're talking about making a trade recommendation or talking about the market or whatever, um, this is registrable activity. It's got to be approved by your compliance department. I, I sort of say this in jest, try to try to try not to lie, try to make sure everything's true, accurate, and not misleading. Um, this applies regardless of the medium that we're dealing with. So whether it's radio, television, print, social media, um, uh, it, it's this, these are the same rules and, and the regulations and the uh, client folks reforms and the zero uh, regulations speak to that. It, it has nothing to do with the medium. It applies. Uh, and in particular, I would focus on social media for uh, those who are trying to reach our newest uh, clients, those who are emerging as uh, the newest investors, as uh, Goshka and Carissa were, were mentioning. This is arguably the, the, the future. We're going to be reaching them electronically um, via social media channels. So make sure that the channel that you'd like to reach out and reach people with is has been approved by your by your registrant to use, by your firm to use. And again, the overarching principle here is that we're going to act honestly in good faith and in the best interest of our clients. So we have to really pay attention to this. So some general rules here, uh, avoid untrue statements, omissions of material facts, and so on. Don't promise something that doesn't exist. Avoid puffery, exaggerated conclusions, and, and make sure that your pieces have balance. We don't want to present just the, the good side of an investment opportunity without the bad side or without the risks. And, and I come back to this as well because the bottom two items are very, very important. Think about your advertising materials in terms of conflicts of interest as well as client confusion because those are the big ones. So if we go to the next slide, and I think I'm going to wrap up after this because I know we're getting short of time. Um, misleading communications, uh, th this was part of uh, the add-on in client focus reforms. And it's a concept that I refer to as holding out and how we carry ourselves, how investment advisors, re advisors, registrants carry themselves in front of clients. So we can't deceive, mislead as to proficiency, experience, qualifications, uh, and categories of registration. Now, initially, what, what the focus was, and there's a specific carve out for this that prohibits it, is the use of officer titles like vice president. So if you had a, an officer title, vice president, senior vice president, that was probably taken or pulled back or scaled back because of the changes that were were coming. And again, I'm all for this. And, and, and this is a public service announcement to my friends at the regulator. Thank you for this. This really does uh, eliminate a source of confusion for some clients, because what I see again is I see that these types of monikers, as well as the marketing materials that we put out, these are very persuasive for clients. So someone thinking that they're going to an investment advisor who is a vice president, for example, they actually might believe that that can influence or provide to them a better investment return. And that's just not necessarily the case. So that's the background behind the, the banning of officer titles as an example. And unless, of course, those are imposed or I'm appointed by a corporate law, and I actually have duties that are mind and management related. So this basically will exclude most investment advisors or most retail um, registrants. Um, the other thing that that has come out recently are the, uh, we've seen them all, these industry awards, the vanity awards, the beauty contest awards. You, we cannot, uh, the industry received a letter, uh, an open letter from the regulators about the use of uh, these uh, types of awards in marketing and advertising materials. And it was a warning to all of us that if any of these are based on assets under management, sales activity, or revenue generation, these are not permitted. Again, if we think about I'm Canada's number one, or I'm a, a 10 star, gold star, whatever advisor, 
how does that correlate to you being a better advisor to provide me with better advice, as an example? Uh, and just lastly, and I'm just going to breeze through this because we're really short of time, part of social uh, social media is part of marketing and advertising. Make sure your, your, your channels are approved. These can be very reputationally or brand sensitive to your firm. Um, there's always the concept of personal versus professional profiles. For personal profiles, really, you're not doing anything professionally on it. Those those are ones that you're going to have to make sure uh, are, are, are not containing any registrable activity or else they're going to have to be supervised. I'm always very careful about likes, thumbs up, uh, happy faces, emojis, all that sort of stuff and what that means. And if you're not tech literate, uh, be very, very careful because these things can be um, extremely unforgiving if you press send. And I think that's it. So, Marshall, I'm going to turn it back to you. I hope we have lots and lots of questions. <laughs> uh, we do. Thank you so much, Sean, um, for walking us th through that. Uh, it's just um, quite uh, encouraging to see, you know, over the years, uh, the regulatory uh, initiatives that that are designed to to protect an investor uh, get stronger and stronger. Um, certainly, since I've been in the business, it's it's um, it's good good for uh, investors it's good for the industry as uh, as as a whole for sure um so we do have lots of questions we have uh, about five or six minutes to take a question so um well maybe since sean you just uh, ended up uh, maybe we'll um, address one of the question the first question to you and this it seems like a simple concept uh, one that we all uh, talk about but there's a couple of questions on suitability and what suitability means exactly how do you define suitability uh, oh uh, do you have uh oh right we, have four, <laughs> we only have four minutes i think i could speak for five hours on this suitability right. is defined through the eyes of the client so this is going to be very very fact specific or fact dependent depending on the type of client that you have depending on the information that they've provided to you is going to influence what is suitable and what isn't. So suitability relates to the advice that I'm giving to them, whether I'm an investment advisor, a medical doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, an engineer, the advice has to be suitable. It has to be appropriate. So I, I'm not trying to define the question with the same answer or with with uh, with uh, the answer that's contained in the question, but it's going to be highly fact dependent. And it's going to be through the eyes of the client. So if, for example, you have a, a 95 year old who wants to buy a 10-year note, you have to ask yourself, how is this suitable based on the criteria that we've articulated and that are presently sitting in the rules? Um, the, the person might have longevity on their side. The person, you know, contrast that with a young family, a, a young couple who is saving for a house. Their, 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 their time horizon might be 50, 60 years, but if they tell you that they are saving for a house and they need this money for a house, that is going to be highly influential about what type of recommendations or investment actions you can offer to them that will be suitable and will meet the suitability requirements. Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, uh, we've got a whole bunch of questions. I'll, I'll have to pick out the ones where there's maybe a common theme. One is, um, and this, I guess, maybe is for, for Goshka and Carissa, um, sort of going forward, uh, advisors will likely need to, uh, to kind of micro-target, to come up with micro-targeting strategies for the various customer uh, segments, uh, rather than taking kind of a one-size-fits-all um you know, up, up, approach um, and really understand the nuances of, of that locable, local uh, uh, addressable uh, market. Um, we've got a few questions here on new Canadians and the sort of the immigrant market and how that sort of fits into the, 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 the whole uh, uh, market and segmentation of the market. And so maybe Goshka from a macro perspective any any thoughts on the you know you talked about the high net worth market and the baby boomer market the female market but where does the immigration kind of fit in so uh we've and, and uh, you know i'll let uh, carissa uh talk a lot more uh um, precisely how to approach this type of clientele but we definitely have baked um a much higher immigration targets we've of course seen an uh an, an, an arrival of a, a large number of new canadians um uh, kind of in the post-pandemic era and we we believe that this will continue uh they are uh, you know the the spread of ages that new Canadians are coming 
Um, and so they're sliding in both in kind of the younger generations, but also in the older generations. So I think that this, the immigration uh, uh, and the wealth that in some cases comes with it, or the, the employment opportunities that are being uh, capitalized and, and wealth being created, it's all part of our forecast. So when you're looking at the, the kind of that wealth forecast, we definitely build the immigrant wealth into it. And as I pointed out, when you look at particular groupings, like, for example, the affluent investors, this is one category that is really being redesigned by the arrival of immigrant wealth, um, whereby, uh, you know, uh, uh, to your point, Marshall, targeting very particular um, ethnic or, or kind of um, uh, cohorts of, of different types of new Canadians is going to be very critical. I'll pass the baton to Carissa. Yeah, I mean, beautifully said, Sasha, and I couldn't agree more. The only thing I guess I would add to that is, you know, when you're thinking about engaging and welcoming, it's a lot about family. So, you know, newcomers to Canada, um, there a lot of newcomers are coming with extraordinary amounts of wealth. And yes, when they come to Canada, there's the, the, the banking fundamentals that they're going to need, like setting up a, a bank account and visa and all those things that, you know, those are the fundamentals, the top priority. But they're coming, um, you know, with family. Maybe family is planning to come over. Um, sometimes there's a lot of, um, you know, sending money back home that needs to happen. So there's, there's all those fundamentals. But, you know, when you think about newcomers to Canada, you, you know, and I'd say in general, it really is about the family. After those fundamentals are done and, and really, like I mentioned before, connecting with resources and communities that, that connect with them, it's about having these conversations and putting them on a journey to achieve what they want to achieve. And I think, you know, we've said it a few times throughout this, um, this presentation and, and session, but, you know, what is important to that newcomer? Maybe it is purchasing a home. Maybe it's not. Uh, maybe it's about purchasing investment properties and renting. Like, we, like there is so much opportunity and there's so much, um, you know, goals and priorities that newcomers to Canada have. We really have to understand what they are and plan accordingly, and then also inform them and keep them, you know, um, up to date on on anything that may be different uh, from where, you know, their home uh, to coming to Canada. And, you know, what are some of the differences? How can you help them get up to speed as quickly as possible? And as well, supporting the family from an intergenerational perspective and, and really wrapping your arms from a relationship and advice perspective, wrapping your arms around the whole family and understanding um, you know, the client situation, their story and where they want to go. I think that that's fundamental um, with any engagement with newcomers. Okay, thank you, uh, Kariska and, and Goshka. We have uh, more questions, but I think uh, I'm conscious of everyone's time. So I think we will end the webinar. Um, excellent conversation today. Um, thank you, Goshka, Carissa, and Sean for participating in this webinar and providing your, your insights. Um, uh, if anyone has any additional questions, please email us at designations at csi.ca. A reminder that a replay of this event will be available in the coming days. Check our, our website. And for more information on upcoming webinars, uh, please also visit our website at csi.ca. And thank you, everyone, uh, for attending, and have a great day.